All right. Okay, um, let's pray as we get ready to open up God's Word. Father, we're so grateful for your Word that you, you want to speak to us today. And you speak so clearly in your Word. So, Lord, as we open it up, uh, give us a heart that's ready to receive whatever you want to speak into us. And we thank you especially for the Word made flesh uh, for every one of us, Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, as we continue to uh, make our way through Ephesians, we've been talking about spiritual warfare, and we've been talking about the armor of God. And this morning, we're going to be talking about the shield of faith. Now, I don't know what you think of when you think of faith. When I think of faith, I think of a story of a nun. And she just received this assignment to work with a group of Apache Indians. And she's so excited that she packs up, she loads her vehicle, she drives off without first checking her fuel gauge, which was just above empty. And she passes what would be the last gas station for miles. And a block later, she runs out of gas. She immediately realizes how fortunate she is because, I mean, she could have been stranded out in the middle of nowhere. So with a lot of joy, she hops out of the vehicle. She trots over to the gas station to buy some gas. And the attendant said, well, we got a lot of gas. We just don't have any containers to put it in. And she pleaded, well, come on, you can find something. Anything will do. So this guy goes around back and he comes back with a bedpan. He says, will this do? And she says, yes, that, that'll, that'll do just fine. And they filled it up with gas. And you just got to really picture this scene in your mind. I mean, she's carrying this, this, this bedpan, and she's in this black clerical garb, okay? And she's pouring the contents of that bedpan into the gas tank. And as she's doing this, this truck driver drives by. He screeches to a stop. He backs his rig up. He rolls down his window and he says, I wish to God, sister, I had your kind of faith. <laughs> I wish I had that kind of faith as well. Uh, whether you realize it or not, every single one of us live every single moment by faith. You say, what are you talking about? Well, physically, think about those of you that are here, how you got here. You climbed into a motor vehicle. You put the key in the ignition. You had faith that it would start. You had faith that when you press the accelerator, it would go. When you press the brakes, it would stop. You had faith that the, the steering cables attached to the steering wheel would be sufficient to keep you on the road. And think about this. You had faith that every single vehicle you encountered would operate by the same rules of the road. That's a lot of faith, isn't it? I mean, especially that vehicle coming at you 70 miles an hour. You don't know that person. Yet by faith, you move over to the right-hand side of the road. I could go on and on, but I think you get the point. We live every single moment of every single day by faith physically, so it really shouldn't surprise us that we live our spiritual lives by faith as well. And yet when it comes to the Christian faith, there's a lot of misunderstanding. I mean, there's some false teaching going around by, by um, the word of faith movement, I think they call it, that if you just believe enough, if you just have enough faith that you can kind of make God do whatever you want, that it's God's will for you to always be happy, never have problems, be wealthy, and never get sick. And it sounds great, doesn't it? The problem is what happens when whatever you're having faith for doesn't happen. Mark Driscoll tells a story of a pastor that taught this kind of stuff for years. And one day his wife uh, tested positive for terminal cancer. What do you do? Do you step, take a step back and kind of reevaluate your theology and stand by and support your wife? Well, this pastor did the unthinkable. He publicly rebuked her before the entire congregation for her lack of faith because if she had enough faith, she wouldn't have cancer. You see how destructive this kind of stuff is? Because if, if whatever you have faith for doesn't happen, it's one of two things. It's either your fault, you didn't believe hard enough, or it's God's fault. Well, we're going to clear up that kind of misunderstanding. We're going to be talking about what real faith is. 
So let's look at Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to start reading with verse 10. Remember, Paul wrote this in prison, and he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, don't let the devil freak you out. I mean, I know some Christians that are totally freaked out by the devil. He's not the opposite of God. He's a created being. He can only be in one place at one time. He's no match for God who's over and above all things. And the demons, you know, the book of Revelation talks about how a third of the stars in heaven followed Lucifer and they became demons. A third. Well, do the math for a moment, okay? Not only is God over and above all things, but the angels outnumber the demons two to one. So don't get freaked out, but at the same time, we need to take this battle seriously. He goes on to say, verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. And then he goes into the pieces of armor. Verse 14, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Jesus said, I am the truth. He also said, the truth shall set you free. You see, one of the ways the enemy attacks us is by way of lies. Well, how can you pick off a lie? You know the truth. He goes on to say, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. We spent a lot of time talking about that one. That on the cross, Jesus took my sin and exchanged it for his righteousness. Not a bad deal, right? So that I can stand before a holy God totally right. And once you begin to realize that, it will change the way you live. And then he says in verse 15, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's another thing that happened on the cross. We have peace with God. And because of that, we can experience the peace of God. God that passes all understanding. And then here's our verse this morning, verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Notice what he says, above all. He mentions three pieces of armor, and clearly he doesn't want us to miss this. He says, above all. In other words, don't miss what I'm saying. Above all, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench. Notice, not some, but all the fiery darts. Some of your Bibles say arrows. Of the wicked one. Notice what it says at the end there. The wicked one. It's talking about the devil himself. Now, let's be real. The devil himself is not going to waste his time on you or me. He can only be in one place at one time. He, he's going to go after bigger fish. But the idea is that even if the devil himself was to try to take you out, this shield would be sufficient to defend you. And then let's quickly read the rest of this, verse 17, and take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So let's talk about this shield of faith. I want you to notice, first of all, that it's entirely different than the first three pieces of armor. The first three pieces are things that you wear, you put on. You can't wear a shield. That's why Paul says, take up the shield. In other words, this shield is supposed to be used given whatever circumstance. It's, it's different, used differently in different circumstances. And let's talk about that word shield for a moment. Because remember, Paul was chained to a Roman soldier. He's trying to think about how to relate these things and he, he compares different spiritual principles to different pieces of armor. And uh, there are different words for shield. A Roman soldier had a small shield that was circular. It was a little bigger than a frisbee. It was strapped to the forearm. It was used in close quarter combat to kind of block and parry an enemy's blows. That's not the word he uses here. He uses a different word, the word therios, which refers to the big shield. It was about five feet tall, three feet wide. Don't forget, people were not that tall back then. Rick would be a giant, okay? Five-foot shield. In other words, this was big enough that the average man back then could put his entire body behind. And notice, this is really the only piece of armor that can adequately defend 
against a barrage of arrows. And the really cool thing about a Roman shield, it often had latches on the side that you could latch on to the, to, to the person right next to you. And if you had a whole line of soldiers, they could lock shields and you would have one solid wall. And that's a beautiful picture of fellowship, by the way. You know, here in America, we lift up the virtue of rugged individualism. I mean, I like that to an extent, except when it applies to Christianity, because that's not the way the faith was meant to be lived. This idea of, hey, it's just me and God, we can get through this thing together. No, he puts other believers in our life. Because here's the thing, my faith might be strong, in which case I need to lock shields with someone who's weak. But on the other hand, there might be times that my faith is weak and I need brothers and sisters in Christ who will lock shields with me to get me through this thing called life. Let me talk quickly about the arrows for a moment. If the shield represents faith, what do you think the arrows represent? Doubt. And the enemy loves to shoot doubt into our lives like arrows. He loves to cloud our thinking. He loves to set our minds on fire. That's one of the reasons why in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we're told to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. When we do that, we use that shield of faith. Doubt. He loves to put doubt. He did it in the garden with Eve. Remember that? Did God really say not to eat? of any tree in the garden. Did God say that? No, he said you can eat freely of every tree in the garden except one. And that's the way he works. The devil will often go after that one thing that God said you can't do. And then he feeds on that to the point that the devil said to Eve, you're not going to die. God knows if you eat the the fruit, your eyes will be open. You'll be just like God. And he doesn't want to let that happen. In other words, Eve, God doesn't have your best interest at heart. He wants to keep you down. He wants to be God all by himself. He loves to shoot those doubts into our lives. Well, let's talk a little bit more about faith. What is faith? Here's the thing that trips up a lot of people. At least it tripped me up when I was in college. I used to think faith was was believing. And yeah, on the surface, that sounds exactly right. And and that's a part of faith, but here's the thing. In college, I had this, this, this idea that as long as I believed all the right stuff, I was okay. I believe there's a God. I believe he loves me. I believe he sent Jesus. I believe he is God in the flesh. I believe everything he said and did in Scripture. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. Three days later, he rose from the dead. I believe that kind of stuff, don't you? And then I had a friend really check me on that, said, well, Bill, the demons believe that. I was like, you're right. You see, James chapter 2 even says, the demons believe, and they tremble. They tremble because they're not willing to give themselves over to what they say they believe. You see, faith is not just believing, it's being willing to give yourself over to that which you say you believe. That's why James says, faith without works is dead. It's not that we're saved by works. He's pointing out a faith that's not willing to act really isn't faith. At all. Now, for the Christian, there are two types of faith. There's a saving faith, and there's a living faith. I think most of you know about the saving faith, right? That happens the moment you reach a point in your life when you realize, hey, my life is not going right with me at the wheel. And at the same time, God is making himself known, and that's kind of exciting. Jesus is becoming real. You you begin to realize, hey, this this God of the universe, he loves me. And you reach a point when, when you trust him. You see, that's really what faith is. It's trust. You trust Jesus. And at that moment, you become what Jesus calls in John chapter 3, born again. What Paul describes in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 as being a brand new creature. What the hymn writer sings about when he says, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like 
me. And if you've never done that, if you've never trusted God for your salvation, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that before we're done this morning, but you don't have to wait on me. You could do that right here, right now in your heart of hearts just by surrendering to him. So that's saving faith. Let's talk about living faith. What do you think living faith is? Living faith is trusting God in the day-to-day details of your life. And here's the thing that gets confusing for some people. Faith is not believing God for something, for whatever outcome comes to your mind. Faith is believing and trusting in a person. That is so important to to really nail down. In fact, let me show you something. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We're not going to read the whole chapter, but this chapter is known as a chapter of faith. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And then he lists some of the Old Testament heroes of faith. He says, by faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Moses. And I want to read, beginning with verse 32, he says, What more shall I say? For the time will fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and of David and Samuel and the prophets. Verse 33, Who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle. I mean, all the stuff you just want to say amen to, right? Awesome stuff. Became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. How about verse 35? Women received their dead, raised to life again. That's awesome, isn't it? But then there's a shift halfway through verse 35. Others were tortured. Ha, I don't like that. Not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two. They were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskin and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And then note verse 39. And all these having obtained a good testimony through faith did not receive the promise. You could substitute the word outcome. They didn't receive the outcome. You know, I don't know what the word of faith teachers do with this chapter. I mean, obviously, these guys didn't have enough faith. Otherwise, none of this stuff would have happened, right? You see, the danger is to treat God like a genie in the bottle, that if we believe hard enough, if we have enough faith, that we can somehow compel him to do whatever we want him to do. Faith is not a mechanism by which we twist God's arm to get what we want. God's going to do what God's going to do. Why? God is good. And God is powerful. And God, believe it or not, knows what he's doing. That's so God about God. The Bible says his ways are, are far above our ways, as high as the heavens are above the earth. You see, real faith, real faith, is a faith that trusts in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Get this. Even when things don't make sense. In fact, let me say this. Especially when things don't make sense. And I believe God still works today. I've seen miracles. I've prayed for people who were sick, and I've watched God heal them. Don't tell me God can't heal. I've also prayed for people. I had a lot of faith, 
and they were not healed, at least not the way I wanted them to be healed. In which we kind of need to take a step back and realize that we don't have the big picture. I mean, who are we kidding ourselves? Short of Jesus coming back, and I do believe he's coming back, but short of him coming back in our lifetime, none of us are going to get out of this alive. Right? We're all going to die of something. And if you think about it, death for the believer is the ultimate healing. 1 Corinthians 13 says we see in a mirror dimly. But there will come a time in which we will know just as we are known. In other words, I believe with every fiber of my being that the things I struggle with, the things that I don't quite understand, the thing I kind of scratch my head at, one day will make sense. And it will all be to God's glory. On the other side of this thing called life, the thing that I just had to trust God with, He'll show me. He'll show me all the ways He was working when I least expected He'll show me firsthand that God can do abundantly beyond anything I could ever think or imagine. And you know what? It's going to make me fall to on my face and worship him all the more. That's what the shield of faith is all about. It's trusting God even when things don't make sense, especially when things don't make sense. I don't know if I want to chase this rabbit, but I might go ahead and do it. Um, some of you might feel like you don't have enough faith. And you're beating yourself up for it. It's interesting, in Luke chapter 17, the disciples struggled with that. They said, Lord, increase our faith. Remember what Jesus said? If you have faith the size of a mustard seed. How big is a mustard seed? It's one of the smallest of seeds. In other words, what Jesus was saying is not how much faith you have. It's about whether or not you're willing to use what faith you already have. As we wrap this up, let me ask you this question. Is there an area of your life that you haven't trusted God with? Don't brush off the question. Think about it. Is there an area of your life, an area that you, you, know, you prefer to kind of ignore, that you know deep down inside you haven't trusted God with? Would you consider trusting him with that area this morning? And for some of you that have never invited Jesus into your life, that's the first step. So I'm just going to go ahead and invite us all to stand, and we're going to have a time of prayer, and we're going to pray over some of this stuff, and uh, then we're going to sing about how good God is. Let's stand, and we'll pray. God, you spoke. All we had to do was read your scripture, and your spirit moves among us, and, and Lord, forgive us when we make faith out to be something you really don't want it to be. It's not about our ability to conjure up enough faith. Real faith is just trusting you. And Lord, we want to pray for the person maybe right here, right now, that is at that point that they realize that maybe you were where I was at in college. You thought, hey, I I believe all the right stuff. I'm okay. And And maybe right now the Lord is starting to reveal to you that that's not enough. It starts with believing the right stuff, but it it extends to giving yourself over to that you say you believe. And maybe there's someone here who has never done that. And we want to pray for that person this morning. And if anyone is praying a prayer, surrendering your life to him, you need to understand it's not about your ability to hold on to God. It's about God's ability to hold on to you. Jesus said, no one can pluck them out of my father's hand. 
All you have to do as a child is simply say, help, I want to trust you. And Lord, anyone that's doing that this morning, we just praise you. But Lord, there might be other people here this morning that there might be an area of their life, maybe a secret area, maybe a closet that you have shut God out of. And the Lord is calling attention to that area. Lord, we don't want to be believers who just trust you with most of our lives. As crazy as it sounds, we want you to stretch us and grow us to the point that we can trust you with every area of our life. So, Lord, if there's a believer that needs to do that, I know I do. Would you even help us with that? We love you and we praise you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. And all the people said, amen. We're going to sing a song called The Goodness of God. Uh, Let me read the chorus to you. It says, all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Let's sing that together.